Hello, everyone. Right now we have with us Aditya Narayan Rai. Uh, he has had a pretty successful zigzag journey so far. Let's listen to him. Over to you, Aditya. Uh, thank you so much for having me here, sir, today. Uh, we have been planning to do this since a long time and finally I'm here today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I am Aditya uh, and uh, currently I'm studying uh, uh, a master's in data science for public policy at uh, Hertie School in Berlin. And uh, originally I am from this small village in one of the smaller districts of Uttar Pradesh in Purvanchal, Mau. Uh, I did all my schooling from my village and uh, after uh, after my intermediate, I uh, moved to, uh, I went to Banaras Hindu University for my uh, uh, bachelor's. I did study uh, bachelor's with sociology honors at the Faculty of Social Sciences in Banaras Hindu University and uh, sociology was my honor subject. And while I was in the uh, third year, I had no idea where to go, what to do. And uh, since I come from a very, like, from a, from a rural background, and most of the times uh, people, uh, especially in my area, people uh, only think about two or three career paths if you have done a BA in social sciences, you know. It can be either you go to a law school or either you go... Uh, to Mukherjee Nagar and prepare for civil services, or uh, you try and uh, get it, get on on the same track, sit for net exam, clear your PhD, and try and get into the PhD things. And at that point of time, me and few of my friends, we are just trying to figure out like what to do and what not to do. And uh, we came across this uh, new university in India, which was offering a public policy course in masters. And uh, we went and talked to one of the teach professors at uh, Banaras Hindu University. And he was like, yeah, it's a new thing. It's a multidisciplinary course. You should try it out. Uh, like this is going to be a new thing, uh, uh, which people will be trying out a lot in coming years. And it is very, very much visible, like, in the way in the last five to six years, the number of universities, the number of small uh, organizations which have started offering courses in public policy, like the field has grown at a very rapid pace. So yeah, we said for exam, we, we, we gave an interview and all, and I got selected for that uh, uh, master's in public policy and governance program at Aj Ajim Premji University. And uh, yeah, uh, that that course was kind of that course is something which introduced me to the uh, development sector and uh, during the course uh, i uh, i kind of took courses which were more towards uh, uh, the policy research side of things so that's how i i started generating uh, interest in uh, doing research which was long gone after completing intermediate and going into sociology, which had become more theoretical that you study on the more theoretical side of things. So yeah, uh, during my uh, uh, public policy course, I went and did a, did a field internship in Gachiroli for two months. That was a life-changing experience for me because I, 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 I got to live in one of the remotest corner of the country where uh, accessibility is a major thing. People don't go there often. People don't want to uh, work there often. So uh, I got that chance from my university. And, Which state uh, is me, this? This is Maharashtra. Uh, the district is Gachiroli. And I was uh, I was stationed in one of the block called Korchi. Korchi uh -huh. block. And it is a border uh, block with the Chhattisgarh. Okay. And uh, yeah, it has a very like large... A very large history of uh, being in the Naxal uh, zone. And yeah. when I was working there, it was the case there. Like still there were many cases of uh, that area. So because of that particular region, uh, that area has been like kind of uh, like not very accessible by many uh, parts of like even the number of organizations which were working there, it was very limited only few organizations which 
had limited space to work there to figure out how to uh, get to the uh, get get the basic necessities running in those areas and the organization which i uh, did internship for we were basically trying to uh, i mean my basic role for those two months was to uh, develop a biodiversity register and uh, develop a forest management plan while working with the village uh, members so we sh we used to do every day in the evening uh, we, we used to do meetings with the local people and try to figure out what are the biodiversity uh, uh, things which can be put up in the register as per the National Biodiversity Act. And then we developed a forest management plan for the area. So that was my major task. But since I was living in the com community, since my daily interaction was with the local people, I mean, th at that point of time, I got to learn a lot about how like and there was apparently there was no one the uh, my mentors were sitting in Bangalore yeah. so <laughs> at the point at that point it was just me and one of my friend who tried to canvas that two months try to figure out like how things move uh, in the social development sector in such a place yeah so once I completed my master's in public policy uh, I uh, got placed in the university uh, I got placed uh, in an organization in Jharkhand. Uh, it's uh, it's a state uh, it's a statewide organization in Jharkhand, which works under the uh, Department of uh, Agriculture and Rural Development. Uh, it's Jharkhand State Livelihood Promotion Society. Uh, I worked in Jharkhand uh, in the Khuti district. For Khuti is like forty kilometers away from Rachi and. Uh, yeah, so that's where I was placed in in the Khuti block, Khuti district and Khuti block. And uh, I was working on this uh, project called Mahila Kisan Sasakti Karan Pariyojana. Uh, the objective of that specific project in that specific area was to help the uh, women, women farmers uh, uh, to take up sustainable agricultural uh, agriculture practices since in Khuti, uh, the area where I was working, the irrigation was a major problem. So we were trying to think of like how we can grow some crops which don't need much water and which can then we can market it through the help of self-help groups uh, and sell it in the uh, in the area. So yeah, that was the project I was working on. Then the elections came and the role and responsibility, everything changed. So at that point of time, I decided that uh, I should move on from here. Uh, and I joined uh, grassroots research uh, and advocacy movement in Mysore as a research associate. And I worked there for around one and a half years. Uh, that role was more of a research role where uh, in the beginning, I was working with a monitoring evaluation team, which was uh, uh, taking, I mean, which was undertaking evaluation research of one of the uh, CSR component of page industries, which was being implemented by government, uh, by Gram, uh, the organization which was I was working for. Yeah, uh, yeah the, the major role of, I mean, the major uh, aim of that program was to, uh, was the holistic development of uh, public schools in five districts of Karnataka. And the focus area was was uh, the infrastructure, uh, the computer assisted learning, mm -hmm. developing skills, and after school uh, hours, uh, education to certain disadvantaged uh, children in the public schools. Yeah, then COVID came, and you all know like how uh, things changed. Uh, the CSR project was scrapped because uh, there was no fund from the comp company side to uh, fund for, for this activity. So the project got closed. Then uh, my responsibility is little bit changed. I started working on developing proposals for the organization. And also during the COVID uh, time, we did a rapid assessment of like, since we had, con since we were working with public schools, we had contact with students, we had contact with teachers and parents. So we did a rapid assessment during uh, that time to see what were the children doing since the schools were closed and there was no clear cut, clear cut directive on 
uh, how they can learn, how, how the teacher can teach, because uh, it was like clear lockdown situation. So we did a rapid assessment to figure out what was the clear situation. And then uh, the volunteers which were working for the mm -hmm. student, the CSR program, we tried to, uh, with, with the help of them, we tried to run a program like uh, in the in all the villages in uh, ne in the neighborhood, like we tried to gather students, teach them with the help of those volunteers. So we did that until the lockdown period was there and there was no clear, clear directive on when schools were reopening. And soon after that, uh, we got a project from uh, Department of Skill Development uh, in Karnataka to do a impact evaluation of their two schemes, Pradhan Mantri uh, Kausal Vikas Yojana and the state component of that, that is Chief Minister Kausal Vikas Yojana. And uh, they wanted to do it on a pilot basis. So we did it, we did it first in five states. And uh, yeah, as soon as that project got over, uh, I moved back to Delhi uh, just to uh, try out like while working with Gram in the education space, I had developed an interest that I want to see and work more in the education space to see and learn more, more about the things because I believe uh, at that I believe that that is the baseline for everything and if that is okay, rest of the things can become okay in the longer term of time. So that's when uh, I moved back to Delhi and I started working with uh, Bidhi Center for Legal Policy uh, as a research fellow. We had a small team. Uh, our focus was inclusive education to work on uh, legal and uh, policy aspects of inclusive education in the field of early childhood development. And uh, when I joined, we were uh, we, we did a, a, a evaluation of one of the program which was run uh, during uh, COVID in Maharashtra, in Mumbai and Pune uh, by Rocket Learning and Akansha Foundation. So the idea was that uh, in early childhood education, the parents are the most important uh, teachers because you know these are the children yeah. at a certain age and if there is no support from the parent side, it's gonna be difficult to develop their cognitive, cognitive and behavioral skills. So these two organizations were trying out a program to see how they can engage parents in the daily uh, teaching and learning activities of the students. And uh, yeah, we did an impact evaluation of that, uh, of that project. And we found that there are some components which can easily work with a certain nudge from the teachers uh, on a daily basis, if they can just remind the parents, if they can just reward, and if they can just provide incentive, some kind of incentives in form of behavioral sense, uh, the engagement increases on a daily basis, you know? So yeah, that's one of the project I did. And then soon after that, we uh, undertook a meta-analysis to understand the out-of-school children proportion during the COVID period, because uh, since schools were closed for longer duration of time and there was limited uh, directive on like how we can build on those last hours, how we can build on those uh, gaps which has come up after uh, after the schools re reopened. Uh, we tried, we, we saw that a number of students were dropping out. Also the reason being that uh, during the COVID period, uh, a, lar a large number of households saw a decrease in their earnings. So mm. instead of sending their children to school, they thought the current priority is, is the food in the house. So most of the uh, children were dropping out from schools and we thought that this might be the time to uh, really take, uh, I mean, really take an approach and uh, uh, provide an evidence to the policy world about that, like, see that there has been extensive dropout and there should be a special focus for dropout children from the from the government so that they can be brought back to the school and they can be retained uh, in the classes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we did, uh, uh, and the basic idea was to use all the primary surveys, which were done by different uh, grassroots organizations during that time, uh, where they recorded that how many children have dropped out. And we did a, uh, 
cross sectional uh, studies like and we found that uh, especially students from the disadvantaged section of the society they were dropping out a lot more when compared to uh, chil uh, when compared to children in the private school and the public schools were the ones which were suffering a lot like they were unable to uh, get the children back although like after a year when asar came and uh, it showed that i mean the results showed that it improved a lot and the clear reason being that all the state governments at that point of time gave up clear directives that uh, you have to uh, you have to work to bring back those children who have been dropping out you have to make sure that uh, they uh, you have to make you have to figure out what is their problem and then try to converse that problem to the other welfare schemes which is being run if food is the problem you try to converse uh, you try to make sure that their family is getting food uh, from the pds system and yeah so the a kind of convergence thing happened between different department and that saw a number i mean that saw the children brought back to school uh, and uh, right after that uh, i got a chance to work in uttar pradesh especially in like directly with the public school and i thought like i i should take that chance the the project was a randomized control trial and uh, the idea was to see uh, like what are the behavioral interventions which can help a teacher a public school teacher adapt a structured pedagogy approach in the classroom you know uh, because most of the studies which has been done by different uh, researchers shows that one of the major reason for low learning rates is uh, is the fact that teachers don't adopt a structured pedagogy approach in the classroom and if you can nudge teachers to adopt that uh, approach in the classroom maybe the learning rate of children will improve you have to uh, you have to you have to focus on providing teachers the inputs like uh, how contextual uh, their way of teaching is how contextual the information they are sharing with uh, their teach uh, with their students is and how they are like dividing their class because everyone in a class is not at the same level so teacher has to uh, figure out a approach to divide the class in accordingly and work with such students in a similar manner and how they can uh, like create an environment where a peer based learning is also growing you know so those were the common behavioral uh, practice practices we were trying to uh, uh, we were trying to test and uh, that was the right time to do it because at that point of time uh, 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 department of education in uttar pradesh has just launched a uh, new teaching guides for the teachers and uh, new workbooks for the students and most of the components which were uh, included in the teaching guides and in the workbooks were uh, based on that structured pedagogy thing so i mean the material was already there it i mean it, it was provided to the students and the teachers in the same year and we thought that maybe if we push the teachers to adopt this these uh, practices and uh, they might be able to uh, i mean there might be an improvement in the learning rates of in the learning rate of the children and uh, yeah i worked there for 6 months and uh, then i got an offer for my data science uh, uh, degree and yeah i had to leave the project in the middle but i i, I was following on the project uh, right now the team is uh, working on the uh, working on the data and trying to figure out what was the impact of those behavioral interventions since the project was year long and the idea mm. was to figure out uh, mm. uh, to see like Uh, how does the behavioral intervention works throughout the academic year what were the core yeah so yeah i mean it will soon be released and i will be more than happy to share it through the platform and with you but okay. uh, yeah and then i decided to come here the uh, the idea being like since i have been working in the policy research uh, side i was trying uh, I, i was i wanted to see more about how certain uh, capabilities how certain capabilities of ai because you cannot run away from it you have to use it in your work and uh, i and many people uh, 
I mean, as you might know that uh, most of the people in policy world, like it is more uh, econometrics oriented when it comes to uh, causal inference research. So for that, for that reason, I uh, wanted to try and learn about these skills. And I thought, why not do a formal degree uh, and uh, learn more about these things? And that's when I decided to apply for this. Why I came to Berlin? The reason being because of my bachelor's in sociology, I was not eligible to study data science in India <laughs> or in America, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I was not eligible at all. So I had to I had to do some research and I uh, figured out that uh, LSC has one data science for public policy program. Hurti School has one. I applied to both the places and I came here uh, to Hurti School. Otherwise, if I had the chance, I would have done it in India. For sure, because you know, uh, I, I miss being there in the sense that uh, when you are doing, when you are working with uh, certain people, when you are in regular touch with uh, people with whom you are working at the grassroot le grassroot level, uh, I mean that makes a large lot lot of difference because what you read, what you understand in, in the paper, in a theory. Uh, it's totally, I mean, in most of the times, it's totally different of how, it's totally different from how people are thinking at the grassroots. If I have to give you an example, like uh, when I, 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 when I was working, when I was working uh, in the education space, you know, uh, most of the time I see, uh, I see research being done uh, for teacher professional development, uh, for trying to provide more uh, resources to the teachers. But very little research or very little discussion was done on how our teachers are like very burdened. Like they have a lot of administrative duties. Like if you talk to them, if you meet them on a regular basis for a week, and if you follow them, you will you will uh, realize that they are working like a clerk in an office who has to do all these uh, all these like administrative activities, and in and they don't have time to prepare the teaching materials for the class. So for them, the secondary activity is the teaching and the <laughs> primary activity is the administrative duties. Yeah. And that is one of the major reasons why they are not unable to focus on uh, improving their skills. It's not, it's not as if that they don't have the skills. I, I've, I've met so many good teachers, but they were so hopeless. They were so like, uh, like, they don't, they, the only thing they can tell me is that, see, I want to do this, but I don't have time to do this. Mm. And there is only, uh, only certain amount of, uh, only certain amount of things I can do. I am a human, human being at the end of the day. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, and when I was doing research, most of the team, when, uh, most of the time when I was talking to people, when I, I was reading about things, this aspect was clearly missing. Nobody was talking about like how we can come up with an idea so that the administrative work of the teachers is reduced and they have more time to focus. I mean, teaching becomes their primary activity and not the administrative work. Mm. So, you know, like these things were, these things were something which I came to realize only when I was working. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's yeah, a brief. Uh, yeah. No, I agree with that, you know, that, yeah. uh, I mean, I am a theoretical guy, but I know that you need to know the field and it's not enough or to know the theory, you have to know the field. You have, you have to know your target beneficiaries. I call them target beneficiaries as a general term. You, know? you have to yeah. understand your target beneficiaries because otherwise if you are top down, it's a hopeless situation. That's you right. are not, you're going to get very little results or very little yield, let us put it this way. You are yeah. fertilizing it with money, but the fertilizer is of the wrong type. You know, yeah. addressing the wrong problem. So I agree with you. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me ask you, what do you think your future is? Ah, I mean, uh, so as you might have seen in my profile, like, I never gave a lot, lot of thought about like what is gonna happen in the next five years. 
yeah but uh, right now uh, uh my i mean the way i have i have been thinking about is that once i complete my degree here uh, i'm going to like continue working in the same space i'm not going to leave this space just because i'm studying data science here so i'm i'm going to continue working in the same space and in next few years i see myself uh, I, i mean i i wanna do a phd in the same space uh, on a topic close to my heart uh, related to india uh, and then i wanna continue working uh, as as a as a research scholar as a research fellow whatever that term is uh, okay. in india and other developing countries you know okay. so, so yeah germany does this is this masters degree are you paying for it or is it free no sir uh, it's a private uh, university so uh, i'm paying for it i have got gotten a, a scholarship for that like so my uh, 25% of fees are waived but rest of them i'm paying for them yeah wow so you have to earn back that money you can't just yeah 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 so that's the reason that uh, i wanna be here for like 2 3 years Yeah. but the thing is that uh, i have been exploring the same space in germany also and there are some organizations uh, who will pay you in euro and then you can work in the developing countries so uh, i just have to figure out i mean i just have to figure out uh, the fees i have paid for for this two years yeah. and then i want to be planning for the next things yeah and, and how do you explain all this to the people in your village ah uh, it's very difficult <laughs> i mean to be honest uh village village is a very like t- long term i mean it's very hard to explain even to my parents like what what is the major thing uh, which i was doing and uh, what is the subject i am studying at this moment and where it will take me you know but the thing is that uh, i personally uh, see that uh, if i am like if i am if i am like uh, very much happy with what i am doing like if i am getting a kick out of this uh, then it should be good enough for me you know there are risks there are uh, certain things which are bound to be there but uh, you have to go out there to explore it and that is something which i have learned from one of my brothers who keep pushing me to try out things to try uh, to try and learn uh, and never run away from things so yeah i mean that's how i see that uh, but when someone ask me like what is the what is the work you do uh, i just told them i work for ngos so that that's how it was because ngo is the word which they can relate to easily uh, especially yeah. in my rural area so yeah. yeah i i just used to tell them that i work for ngos and okay. if they wanted to go deeper i just tell them i'm just working with an ngo supporting uh the department of education in up that's all so you know aditya uh, i forgot to tell you but i have uh, told every speaker now that uh, if you want to speak in your mother tongue native tongue for a few minutes directly to your people please do so and people have done you know malayalam telugu bengali so on if you want to speak to the people who might actually not be so fluent in english in hindi you are most welcome to if you have anything that message you want to i am fluent in hindi so it's not a problem but i've heard people in every language but the problem is it just doesn't matter whether i understand it but in case you want to uh, you are free. and if you want a minute to think about it we can put it on pause and then we can come back and do it but do you want that option so sure, sir I, i can do that like uh, my mother tongue is bhojpuri since i come from purvanchal yeah uh, so yeah i can put out a message i mean yeah there is no okay. problem so uh, whenever you are ready to do it let's do it yeah do it now i can do it now i Abhi can do it now yeah <laughs> yeah the uh aap sab anke baat hi batave ke ha ki agar aap कुछ कई चाहत है अगर जिंदगी में लाइक तो के लगत है कि जवन कार्य हम करे जात है ओमा कोनो फायदा ना बा ओकर कोनो रास्ता ना दिखाई देत 
तो उसे पीछे हटले की जरूरत ना है वो रास्ता पे तो के आगे जाए के चाहिए आ तो के एकदम अंत तक जाए के चाहिए हो सके लाइक रास्ता में बहुत सारी मुश्किलें आवे जैसे कि कबो तोरे लगे रुपया ना होई कबो तोरे लगे दोस्त ना होई हां कबो तोरे लगे कुछ ना होई लाइक कोनो साधन ना हो और तो के हम बताओ थी अपने एक्सपीरियंस से हम ही सब जल लें हर जगह पे रुपया का कमी दोस्त का कमी अकेले लेकिन तब वो अगर तू आखिरी तक जाके वो मुकाम के पकड़ सकेला तो पकड़ ले के प्रयास कर कह से कि जिंदगी का मजा यही में है बाकी गांव में रहले में घरे में रहले में वो मजा 20 साल 22 साल ठीक है उम्मत मजा आई बे करेला लेकिन एक बार तू गांव से निकलब ये सब चीजन के देखब तब तो के लगी कि हां दुनिया बहुत बढ़िया बा एम सब कुछ हमके कैले का मौका मिल सकेला ऐसा ना है कि दुनिया हमके रोकी अगर रोकी तो तू लड़ सकेला तोरे अंदर उ क्षमता हवे अपने आप के कबो कमजोर मत समझिया दैट्स ऑल्सो इज गुड आई अंडरस्टैंड तो ठीक है या आई कैन वॉच फॉर इज सच सो स्वीट यू नो एनीवे एनीथिंग एल्स यू वांट टू ऐड हियर आ नथिंग सर नथिंग मेजर लाइक I just wanted to uh, share a few experiences from the research work. What I, I since I follow you a lot and I see that you write a lot about uh, certain things over LinkedIn. So I just wanted to share a few things about like yeah. key key results which I felt like uh, very which are very important uh, for people to know when they are working in social development sector in certain areas. So I just wanted to share some results from Please. the works which I have. done yeah so i'll just like i'll just divide it into how i have grown how i have grown when i was working in jharkhand uh, as a young professor young professional in kuti district uh, and i was working in livelihood and micro credit space and i found that the ideas which are coming are very nice you know like the idea to uh, like graduate someone from one category to another category yeah. like from ultra ultra poor to poor you know uh, the idea to uh, increase someone's earning the idea to uh, improve someone's financial being they are really nice they are like they have been tried and tested in different environments but the key thing which which is missing at the grassroots level is something which has to be taken into account when someone is uh, working and designing such policies and the first thing is the contextualization you know something which worked in uttar pradesh is not going to work in jharkhand because uttar pradesh and jharkhand are not similar you know and the second thing is that sometimes like sometimes when i was working with with the administrative officials at the block level at the district level i felt like there since i am a student of sociology i can say that since i felt that there is something which is missing and that is empathy you know when you are doing when you are doing when you are working for certain disadvantaged section of the society who has not been able to grow because of historical reasons you know you have to keep empathy in your work you can't be like you can't be someone who who take it as an order or like who take it who deliver something as an order and most of the time at the grassroots level with these two things missing many things fails you know i mean the work look good you might have completed your target that's good you reached out to 100 farmers in the village that target is complete uh, you did run the program for two or three months that target is complete at the end of the day in the ppt the targets might be looking good but in the ground when these things are missing i don't see any change those people are still there and those people are still struggling you know yeah. so those two things especially for people who are living in uh, i mean for people who are working in these two space i felt like these are the important skills which you learn through uh, which you learn over a period of time you know then when i was working in a uh, skill development space the major finding of the research we did was that again the focus here also are both the schemes like one is the national level scheme and another is the state component of that scheme the focus was on completing the targets you know you have quarterly targets of enrolling 
50 students at your uh, at your center in certain job trade and then that's done like that is the target but when you think about the quality of content and the kind of training they are re uh, uh, receiving mm -hmm. there is nothing there because at most of the centers when is, when we were visiting for like quality checks and we are attending the classes we didn't find enough content there they were not learning anything at all so there was a clear skill gap which was emerging like i am i have i am someone who have a uh, who has a, a iti degree in electrical but i don't know anything about electrical that was the situation in most of the cases yeah and and the and the other thing was like uh, most of the nature of these skills is i mean uh, these skill programs is that you try to you try to give trainings which is more which is more uh, required in your uh, local area in your uh, district with the small scale industries whatever are there who are working there so you do a market market survey you try to figure out what are the major school skills these uh, organizations need and then you try to provide those skills but there was a clear mismatch you know when yeah. we did a study with the employers and when we did the study with the organization there was no match of the clear yeah. skills yeah. there was yeah. a clear skill gap yeah. and when we presented our results people were not ready to accept that yeah. from both the sides and yeah. that was very disheartening to see because you know this this skill gap is existing that's why most of the students are either unemployed, unemployed and most of the time there is nothing for them to work on you know and i told you about the education space like how one key component is missing about the teachers yes uh, in the early childhood uh, childhood education and development i feel that the structure to the structure to develop uh, the holistic capability of a child is there but again the burden is too much on the lowest level which is the anganwadi yeah, that is you know it's a joke it is yeah it's a joke you yeah. know again if you look at the uh, directive a uh, anganwadi worker has 29 sets of administrative work to do you know 29 <laughs> sets of administrative yeah, work yeah. and she has one helper whose job is to cook food and then she has to take care of all the children who are coming from the village I mean, how is gonna? How is she gonna do that? And then at the end of the day, you are not paying her. You are not calling her an employee. Right. You are just calling her a volunteer. A volunteer, you know. <laughs> it's 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 yeah. totally missing. And I was hoping that some some of these things will be maybe uh, will come out once the discussion about new national education policy will start. When the implementation of these things will start, <laughs> but it didn't come out at all. No. And so I feel like from my research, from my uh, understanding, these are the basic basic necessities components which are very much missing, which should be prioritized at the earliest if if there is to be a need for that to be done. The simil similar story is with the Right to Education Act, sir. The idea was right, the implementation bad, you know, when people when when you translated the when you translated the policy components of the act to the to the lower level bureaucrats you translated it as something where you have to focus on infrastructure and focus on enrollment and then forget about retention and forget about teaching yeah you know and that translation made a mess of everything you know yeah. like in in the last 10 years the learning rate instead of improving it has been going down and we have yearly results for that from usr to so that yes but no <laughs> i read usr every year yeah. <laughs> so and we... no one talks about that so just a feeling that maybe when something is being designed something is being worked upon a multi-dimensional approach is very important and you at the end of the day don't forget the context where you are talking about these things because india is a diverse country and you can't have a one fit approach all for everything so yeah. that's just i wanted to share from few of my works which i did with these organizations okay anything else uh 
Nothing, sir. I okay, think, all right. Yeah. Let's end it yeah. here. And I'll be back with uh, another young person or an expert or Aditya, who is a young expert. <laughs> sir. All right. I don't tell Let's myself. Let's say bye now and I'll talk to you offline.